Okay. So, um, probably time to go ahead and get started. So, yeah, um, I guess Alvaro will be here after Christelle's talk. So, um, it's up to me to mess up the recordings before Alvaro gets here. Um, no. Um, so, before I get started in the talking about the math, I wanted to kind of take a second to say something I was going to say yesterday, but of course, with all the hustle and bustle, I um, forgot. Um, kind of just like a, I don't know, some um, advice, I guess, on on learning things and summer school and conferences and working with people and stuff. Um, and I, part of the reason I say this is um, because I know for a lot of you in, for a big chunk of your education in the last couple of years and in your maturing mathematically, you've been doing that remotely or in weird settings and stuff like that. So um, yeah, anyway, point being, uh, the, the points I wanted to make First off is, um, let's see, who, who's heard of a growth mindset? That's it's becoming more popular, about 50%. So the idea with a growth mindset is your intelligence isn't just some fixed quantity that you're born with and, you know, you're either J.P. Sayre or you're not and, you know, good luck if you're not. Um, that's not kind of how things work out. Certainly some people are, are a little more naturally talented than other people, but intelligence is not this fixed quantity, especially with respect to math. And I, y'all may have noticed in your own personal mathematics learning, I certainly have in my learning that you get better, not just at doing things you already understand, but you actually get better at learning mathematics and better at understanding concepts and better at making connections. And so I encourage you to be patient with yourselves and not get down on yourself. I know it's super easy. I've definitely been to conferences where I'm like, I'm the dumbest one here. Everyone here is like so brilliant. And I like, can barely connect, you know, I don't know, things. Um, so I encourage y'all to have a growth mindset and really be patient with yourselves. Um, in a similar vein, I really just, um, I, I, I encourage y'all to kind of be patient with each other and be, um, try to facilitate like useful conversations i know there's a i i've certainly felt it and i've been in situations where everyone's just trying to kind of like oh yeah there's so many people here and they're all really good at math we all want to show off how much we know and um in it's easy to feel like that and um you know i i i think i i would just say i encourage y'all to try to um as much as you can be honest about what you don't know be honest about what you don't understand and um ask people questions and try to learn from each other. And oftentimes I find those kind of more open conversations are actually where I like learn some interesting stuff from people. And we, and I've realized what I don't know and what I do know. And um, anyway, so the, just kind of a, a big picture working together and collaborating with each other and that kind of thing. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say, <laughs> which is terrible advice to give as someone who's, uh, giving presentations in a conference and in, in the summer school is don't be afraid to skip stuff. Some of um, there's definitely I I know for me you know my my cup gets full my my little cup in my brain that holds how much mathematics I can learn in a day, and once it's full it's kind of like a it's not a very useful enterprise for me to try to keep filling it because it runneth over, um, and uh, so there's some awesome hiking around that you can literally just walk to. Um, I think it's called Cow Barn Hill. There's, there are a few things to do in stores. So don't be afraid if you're just like, I'm, I'm done. I can't, I can't really put anything else in my brain to take some time off and have some fun. And oftentimes in my experience, that actually helps me get more out of something because I come back recharged as opposed to like this frazzled stress ball of nerves and inadequacy. Um, Okay, so that's kind of my big picture uh, advice, if I may be so bold as to think that I can offer you any meaningful advice. Um, now let's talk about the mathematics. 
Um, so last time we defined this notion of a number field. It was, you know, a number field is you take the rational numbers, you throw something in there, you look at the field you get, and we want to understand that in the same way we try to understand the rational numbers. And so the, our favorite thing about the rational numbers, because we're number theorists, is the ring is the integers. So we want to define an analog of the integers in these number fields, and we do. We say, oh, it's the all the stuff that satisfies monic polynomials with integer coefficients. Okay, and then we computed some some integers, and then we talked a little bit about what can happen to primes, and we're going to talk a lot more about that today. But first, we're going to briefly introduce some notions. Um, and I unfortunately don't have time to do near as much as I'd like somehow trying to cram the ideas from a semester worth of algebraic number theory into four lectures is impossible. So, um, the, basically I'm going to define these two quantities, the norm and the trace, and they're both depending on these embeddings of my number field into the complex numbers. And these embeddings come from taking a root of my polynomial or taking, I'm thinking my number field is Q adjoin X modulo F of X. X is just this abstract thing such that it satisfies F of X. And I'm mapping it to one of the honest to goodness roots I have over the complex numbers. And I know I have those roots by the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, so, a polynomial of degree n, it's irreducible. It has indistinct roots. And so I get indistinct maps that send my number field into the complex numbers. And these embeddings carry a lot of information. And this is kind of eventually sort of a starting point for um, Galois theory and so forth, but we're really not gonna get into Galois theory. Um, we're gonna try to avoid it as much as possible and just say, that these embeddings carry a lot of information about our number field. And one way we can get at some of that information is <clears throat> taking the product of all the uh, um, embeddings. So if I have some gamma and I wanna know some information about gamma, I can take the product of all these, um, of the image of gamma under all these embeddings. And that is actually gonna turn out to be um, an element of Q. So by taking this product, I get something up in my upstairs number field and I can map it down to Q. And now I can understand it. And this map um, has a number of nice properties. Um, we're not gonna do too, too much with the trace, but you can also define the trace. And secretly in the background, we talked a little bit about this in the problem session last night. You have this characteristic polynomial, which you know is like computing the eigenvalues of the matrix that represents multiplication by gamma as a linear transformation of your vector space K, thinking of it as a Q vector space. So there's secretly some linear algebra back here that's telling you why, why should I expect these quantities right here to have anything to do with, with polynomials and with being rational and so forth. But again, we don't really have time to rigorously prove all that. Just suffice to say the norm and trace are very interesting and useful quantities associated to an algebraic number, an element of K, and we're gonna use them. Okay, so, um, yes, yes. Mm. Um, here's the glib answer, <laughs> um, is K is a Q vector space, right? K is, I can think of K as this, in dimensional Q vector space. And um, if you believe me that this product is actually going to be a uh, coefficient of this characteristic polynomial of the matrix A associated to multiplication that corresponds to multiplication by gamma, if you believe that, then this characteristic polynomial is going to live in the base. Um, the base field of scalars. So this is all a Q vector space. So my characteristic polynomial, rather than being in K, is in Q. So that's kind of the hand-waving sentimental answer for that. To 
Um, I think as Keith mentioned last night, that underlying this is something called the Cayley Hamilton theorem. And there's some work in linear algebra. But suffice to say, everything's a vector space over Q. So this characteristic polynomial respects that over Q part. And so it's in Q. Okay, cool. Great question. Right. So um, the norm has a number of wonderful properties, which we're going to exploit for trying to factor numbers, algebraic integers, in our bigger ring of integers. We don't really understand the bigger ring of integers as much as we'd like, but we do understand a lot of things about prime factorization in the integers. And so, uh, first off, norm is multipl multiplicative. So that's great. If I'm trying to factor things into primes, primes are my multiplicative building blocks, and the norm respects that. Awesome. Um, so another great thing, the norm also kind of knows when stuff is an integer in, in some sense. So if I have an algebraic integer gamma, then the norm is not just in Q, but it's in Z. So even better. And kind of, I guess, underlying that is, is again, the same heuristic about Q vector space. If this is secretly in the ring of integers as a quote unquote Z vector space, a Z module, then the characteristic polynomial knows that and behaves well with that. Um, okay, cool. So these things actually live in the integers if I started with an algebraic integer. So that's useful too. If I take a random element gamma and I get norm one half, well, that thing was probably, that's not an, I know it's not an algebraic integer right off the bat. Yes. Yeah, 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 you can, so if we were really going to go into this, that's an excellent point. You know, you can think of elementary symmetric polynomials and, and do work through, through that vein as well. Um, so excellent point. Um, but as you can see, I'm stating these as facts. So I am very explicitly not trying to get into the reads and prove things since I only have about 35 minutes left. Um, and I want to already talk about prime ideal factorization at some point today. So, cool. Um, right. So, if I started with an algebraic integer, the norm's going to be an integer. And um, let's see, another point I want to make right now that we talked a little bit about yesterday is units. So in the integers, we don't count factorizations. It's different if they differ by minus one. You know, six is two times three. It's also minus two by times minus three. We don't really care. That's not different fundamentally. As we've learned though, with thinking about like the Gaussian integers, there's new units. So there's new things to live in your factorization and, and make it look different to a human looking at it, but not make it actually different in terms of what the prime elements appearing in your factorization are. So for example, um, Z adjoined I has units uh, one, minus one, I, and um, minus I. That, that is a crappy minus I. Um, ah, okay. I've gotten too comfortable with my double clicky thing. Okay, minus i. So there's new units, and the Gaussian integers are about the nicest ring of integers you could ever hope for. So if you get a slightly less nice ring of integers, you get even more exotic new looking units. One example that is actually a very nice unit, but doesn't seem nice at first, is minus one plus square root of minus three over two. That's actually a unit. And if I cube it, I get one. So, there's some things that definitely don't look like units to me at first glance that are. So we need to be aware of these. And the norm actually helps us out tremendously because the norm detects units. So if I have a unit, um, and here we got the definition, a unit is something that divides one. Um, I have a unit if and only if its norm is plus or minus one. So the norm picks out these units, and that's great. Okay. So here, um, I think I put this up when I posted these last night, 
um, here's an example of how we can use the norm to help us with, um, with prime factorization. So um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just gonna walk through this argument right here. Um, I guess I could also talk about like factoring this. Turns out that 181 is prime. Um, so maybe maybe we'll just do that. We'll just we'll just do an honest to goodness example, and y'all can look at the um, the blue text here on your own time if you if you like. So I want to show that um, I want to show, and then also I encourage you to look at the the claims we made in um, up here and see if we can figure these out. Maybe. I don't know, what do y'all wanna do? Y'all wanna do one of these in question 1.6 or should we do that um, other one down down below? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I wanna show 10 plus nine i is prime in z adjoint i. Okay, so here's my my strategy for this. I'm going to take the norm. Norm. And oftentimes I'll drop this subscript right here if it's clear what I'm talking about, but just to, to write it out, this is the norm relative to Q adjoined I over Q. If I extended my field even further, it would have more embeddings into C, and so the norm would change, right? But, um, so I have this. And I want 10 plus 9i. Okay. And so the first embedding of this into C is just 10 plus 9i. Okay, great. And if I'm thinking of i as x, right, I got 10 plus 9x, where x is the root to x squared plus 1. What is the other place I, I can send x? I sent x to i minus i is the other root that I can send it to. Okay. So in other words, my sigma of 1 sends x to i, and sigma 2 sends x to minus i, and these sigma i's are my embeddings, my maps from q adjoined i, well, I'll write it like this, q adjoined x modulo x squared plus 1, injecting into c. Sweet. So I have this, and my other root is minus i. So I got 10 minus 9i. And then I multiply those out, and I get 100 minus plus 81 equals 181. Okay. And so the fact, or you, we could compute uh, whatever the square root of 181 is and figure it out. It's not divisible by 2 or 3 or 5, so it's probably prime, right? Um, so in fact, um, 181 is a, a prime of z. So already we're seeing, we started, we got to kind of start to be careful about what's prime where. 181 is a prime of z, but as we can see, it's not going to be a prime of uh, the Gaussian integers. Okay, it's a prime of z though. And so let's say, I'll, I'll do this. Suppose, so if, if 10 plus 9i isn't prime, there exists a factorization gamma delta, say, where neither gamma nor delta are units, right? Obviously, I could say 10 plus 9i is, you know, 10 plus 9i times i times minus i or something like that. That doesn't really, um, that's not a different factorization. Okay, um, where gamma and delta are not units. Okay, in this setup, so that, that, that means, that's an if and only if, the norm of, of gamma 
is not equal to one and the norm of delta is not equal to well plus or minus one it's also not equal to plus or minus one okay so they're non-units so if i have such a factorization we have that norm remember norm is multiplicative so norm of gamma times norm of delta equals norm of 10 plus 9i equals 181. This is an equation in Z. It's not just an equation. It's a non-trivial factorization of 181 in the integers. Okay, that's a contradiction, right? 181's a prime. Okay, so this is a contradiction. And so we conclude, oh, that's my weird contradiction symbol. Uh, I don't, I've never met anybody else who uses it, but um, <laughs> contradiction. Oh, yay, cool. There's, there's others. There exists others. Um, my professor in undergrad, the same one who would purposely get confused, um, use that symbol and you know how things stick your young impressionable mind and contradiction symbols stick anyway so uh we get a contradiction and we conclude that 10 plus 9 is actually a prime and kind of if you want a little bit of a geometric way of looking at what's going on I don't want to talk about schemes, but um, down here we got 181, you know, and that's a, a nice, um, that's like a point of the integers because it's a prime. That's, that's a, a, a like part of the integers, part of how the integers are built multiplicatively. And so this is down here in Z, and then up in Z adjoined I, the Gaussian integers, that point breaks into two new points. We get 10 plus 9I and 10 minus 9i, right? The same argument we used to show 10 plus 9i as prime is also gonna work for 10 plus, minus 9i, right? Okay, cool. So that's, we kind of, um, we get a little bit of a picture in, in um, what's going on. And there's a degree two extension and my prime split into two. And, and so we're gonna try to today start to get a feel for what's going on when primes don't split, when they stay inert and when primes ramify and try to see what we should expect to happen with primes. Okay, um, at this point, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, Maybe it would have been better to start with thinking about um, rather than thinking about this, thinking about 10 plus 9x, where x squared plus 1 equals 0. And then sigma 1 maps x to i, because sigma has to take x to a root of x squared plus 1. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to be an injection. Things are going to fall apart and everything's going to collapse, right? If x squared is supposed to be 1 and I took x to a to third root of 2, then I'm, I'm in trouble. Um, so I got to send x to a root of this polynomial x squared plus 1. There's two roots, as, as we know, i and minus i. Those are the, the roots of x squared plus 1. So I'll send, I'll define these, these, um, homomorphisms from from this number field into C, I'll send Q to Q. Q lives in C, so I send Q to Q. And now all I need to figure out is where to send X. And so I can send X to I. That's a perfectly reasonable homomorphism. And, you know, we most of the time when we're thinking about this number field, we just think of it, X as identified with I. Or I can send it to the other root. So I can send X to minus I. And everything still works out because X squared is equal to minus 1. And so um, once I have that, then my norm is just applying 
this is sig sigma one of 10 plus nine X, and this is sigma two of 10 plus nine X. Good question. Okay, so um, prepare yourselves for disappointment. I guess you should always be prepared for disappointment, but um, prepare for some, some deep disappointment. Traumatizing. Unique factorization into primes is the best thing ever. It's absolutely awesome. And so far, the rings of integers we've met have unique factorizations into primes. Unique factorization into prime. No, you know, they're primes and these new rings of integers, but still unique factorizations into primes. Um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't always work like that. Not all number rings have unique factorization. And here's the classic example of that. This is the ring of integers of Q adjoined the square root of minus five, right? Five minus five is congruent to three mod four. So the ring of integers is just square root of minus five as we've, as we've determined. Um, okay. And so I have these, these two different factorizations of six right here. And these look pretty different. Maybe these things decompose further. And if they decompose further, everything works out and I get unique factorization into prime elements. But the exercise here, the example disguised as an exercise or exercise disguised as an example is to show this doesn't work out. And so my, my hint here would be like use norms and um, you know, the norm of a plus B square root of minus five is going to be equal to a squared plus five B squared. And if I know that equals a, um, equals a, uh, positive integer, I can kind of bound what a and B can be. Right. And so anyway, that's the hint for the exercise, but suffice to say unique factorization fails. And so. Humor realized this. And, you know, I, I would have sobbed to myself in a corner. Maybe Coomer did. But then he tried to salvage some of the ideas behind prime factorization for these new number rings. I mean, I mean these number rings kind of, they seem really nice. Everything's a root of a nice monic polynomial with integer coefficients. Maybe we can do something to rectify this egregious unjust situation where we don't have unique factorization into primes. My favorite open problem in number theory, and this is like an absolutely frustrating open problem, is it's unknown whether there are infinitely many number rings of say degree less than 2022, but pick your favorite favorite positive integer with unique factorization. It's believed that 70% of just real quadratics taking a, a square root of a positive number, it's believed about 70% of those are gonna actually have um, unique factorization. Oh, it's an open problem. So isn't that so frustrating? Our favorite thing about the integers, we don't even know if infinitely many of these puppies have it, but um, they, they, they really should, but it's, it's a, an open problem. Um, okay, so how are we going to fix this? Um, so a tangent on roots of unity in the unit circle, I would love to go on this tangent, but I will, um, <laughs> I definitely don't have time. Um, suffice to say though, if you'd like to look for kind of a, a little justification of why we've built all this stuff and what it might actually be helpful for, here's, here's a little example. And I will just briefly kind of detail this example, we can, we can take this number field where we have a fifth root of unity. We're trying to solve for Ma's last theorem for the exponent five. And now we can factor the left-hand side. And it turns out Z adjoined a fifth root of unity is the ring of integers and it has unique factorization. So all my favorite techniques I use from the integers when I'm factoring things and looking at modulo primes and stuff like that, all that works here. So here's a 
we can see a benefit of all this structure we've started to build up is if I'm interested in solving Diophantine equations, say solving problems like this, I can bring to bear a lot of the powerful tools I, I use from Z, but with some extra, um, with, with other nice properties that these new rings of integers let me have, like factoring the left-hand side of the Fermat equation. So that's an example of why someone would bother with all this machinery and stuff like this. Also, it's just, it's the right thing to do and it works for it. Everything work, everything you'd hope to, anyway, I'll stop rambling, whatever. Uh, this is some vague justification in a little bit of a sketch. And um, Marcus is a great book and Borovich and Shafarovich is out of print. You can find a PDF online. It's, it's got some stuff in it that other books don't have. I really, uh, I think it's, it's quite nice um, for, for some materials. Okay. Um, so at this point should we go ahead and rectify see if we can make up for the fact we no longer have a unique factorization into primes we're gonna have to do some definitions though we gotta we gotta do some work and um thankfully coomer and dedekin and really um the generalization of all this is is due to emmy no there um they put in this um this work so so that we can kind of recover the some of the best things about prime factorization okay so if you've seen abstract algebra before you might have heard of the notion of an ideal so what an ideal is is an additively closed subset of my ring i have a ring i have an additively closed subset um and it has this what i like to call the multiplicative sucking property so if i take an element i of my ideal and I take an element R of my ring and I multiply I by R, it sucks it into the ideal. So IR becomes part of the ideal. Um, yeah, IR and I for every I and I and R and R. Okay, that's an ideal. Um, I mean, these are kind of like the right thing to think about with rings in some sense. They're like a thing you can mod out by. Um, they kind of help you break your ring apart. Um, and the name comes from ideal numbers. So, so this was kind of Coomer's idea where he wanted to, you know, you can't just do it with numbers, but maybe you, you can have this, like, they, they really kind of sort of behave like numbers and you can get a lot of the nice properties. So that's what's up with these ideals. Um, and here's the punchline of all this, because I know it's, it is traumatic thinking about unique factorization failing. So I want to give you all some, some comfort here. Um, the punchline is that every proper non-zero ideal in OK as a ring, th this ring of integers, factors uniquely into prime ideals. <laughs> That's a great question. What does it mean to multiply ideals? So in the, we will answer that in more detail, but kind of my, my glib response would be, you're just thinking about these as like kind of having a lot of the properties of numbers, but not quite. And their product is, is like the product of numbers, like the product of integers. Um, and in the case where you're working with the integers or where you're working with a place with unique factorization, this statement is is not any different than every integer factors uniquely into a product of primes. So, um, yeah, I would just think about this as like every number factors uniquely into a product of primes with some extra machinery when we get that weird stuff like we had with six before. So we'll, we'll work through it. Okay. So let's, I wanted to give you the punchline early on, and now we're gonna to try to unpack and, and see if we can start understanding this punchline a little better. That, and that's a great question. I mean, like, what does it mean to, what are these things and what does it mean to factor into a product of them? Um, well, it means I is equal to this product of ideals. Well, okay, what's a product of ideals? We'll get there. Um, so, um, first of all, what's a, um, what's a prime ideal? So, one definition for a prime number is P's prime if whenever P divides a product, P 
P divides one of the factors of the product, right? If P divides A, B, then either P divides A or P divides B. You could say the same thing with a proper ideal. If whenever a product of two numbers is in, an, in, is in that ideal, either one, alpha's in that ideal or beta's in that ideal. So I can't get two numbers that aren't in the ideal, multiply them together and pop into the ideal. So the mantra here is to contain is to divide. So P contains AB, um, P divides AB. A and P or B and P, P divides A or P divides B. So that's kind of, that's one little bit of translation back and forth between primes, prime numbers and prime ideals. Uh, yes. Oh yeah, so um, that's, that's a good uh, point. There's some subtleties with whether the whole ring is an ideal, and I mean the whole ring is an ideal, um, but we're not going to really worry too much about that. You know, we don't want to, um, yeah, you, you don't try to factor all the integers together. <laughs> um, so by that, I mean a something that's not the whole ring. Also, zero is an ideal, and so we'll kind of, also brush that aside and not worry too much about that. There's, uh, that's a great question though. Um, and again, this is the, one of those um, points where if we were taking a class on algebraic number theory, we'd spend two weeks like just discussing ideals and, and getting super used to them. But we're, we're zooming, we're, well, actually we're WebExing, which is awful, but um, whatever, okay. That's a great question though. Um, so to contain is, is to divide. And here's, let me try to give you a little intuition for this because I know we've, we've just thrown down a, a bunch of definitions, a mantra, a punchline, it's, it's a lot. So if I have an element alpha in R, I can take the ideal generated by alpha. And that's gonna just be alpha times everything in my ring. And we can we can check that um, that is an ideal. It's additively closed. If I um, another way of writing this too, I, I just want to say is also alpha r, just alpha next to r, which makes sense. Taking every element of r and multiplying it by alpha, we can check it's additively closed. If I have alpha r naught plus alpha r one, um, that's equal to alpha r naught plus r1, well, r naught plus r1 is a perfectly good element of r, so that's in the ideal. Um, and then it has the multiplicative sucking property. You know, if I multiply alpha blah times some element of r, I get alpha blah r, and we're good to go. Anyway, um, so this is an ideal. It's called a, um, it's called the ideal generated by alpha. And um, you can generate an ideal by multiple elements in a, a similar manner, uh, which we'll see an example of in, in a second. But um, if an ideal is generated by a single element, we say it's principal. And these principal ideals are gonna be very important for our whole kind of, uh, for what we're wanting to do in, in algebraic number theory. So just to kind of get our feet on slightly more solid ground, let's figure out what's going on here with the integers. So, what are the principal ideals of Z? What are the ideals generated by one element of Z? Not, it's not a trick, trick question. No. Yeah, pick your favorite element of Z and then take the ideal generated by that. So, for each, in and in, in Z, I can just take, I can take in Z, and I also write this in, and this is just the set of um, all N times A for A N Z. Okay. Sweet. So all the multiples of 
of uh, n. Awesome. Those are all my principal ideals. And then what are the prime ideals? I mean, just, might as well just guess, yeah. Bingo, yeah. They're, they're the, um, it turns out they're gonna be the principal ideals generated by prime numbers. So, yeah. Yes, the zero ideal is technically a, uh, a prime of Z because if we quotient by the zero ideal, we, we have Z and that's a domain. Um, and so that's, that's like that like excellent side case that was brought up earlier. It's like the whole ring Z is technically an ideal, right? Um, it's multiplicatively closed and it has the multiplicative sucking property. Okay, but the zero ideal is also an ideal, but we kind of like push those cases to the side a little bit. Um, okay, um, excellent point. Um, so here's the, um, yeah, so in the same way, we can talk about uh, prime ideals. Like if I take the ideal four, right, or four, for z, this is a set of all multiples of four. Got minus four, zero, four, eight, so forth. Is this a prime ideal? Well, notice that two times two is in four, four z, but of course two, neither two nor two is in four z. So, 4z is not a prime ideal. And so we can see how here from the definition of ideal and the definition of, of prime that we're used to, they, they kind of match up with each other. Not kind of, they, they really do, right? Um, if P divides A times B, then P divides A or P divides B. Well, four divides four and, you know, four is two times two and four doesn't divide two. Um, and of course this works well with other examples. So the prime, uh, to summarize here, the prime ideals of Z are the ideals P, Z, and zero, and the zero ideal. If A times B equals zero, then either A or B is zero. Anyway, um, so if you haven't seen ideals before, I know it's pretty confusing. I would just say, think about them as principal ideals. Think about them as just elements. Um, but when you run into trouble and you can't, and you don't have unique factorization into elements, then, these non-principal ideals can sometimes help you. And so you'll still have prime ideals underlying your non-unique factorization. Okay, so we can define the sum and product of ideals. Um, the sum is defined in what I think to be the, the most straightforward way that you'd, you'd expect. The sum of A plus B, take an element of A, take an element of B, add them together, do that for any element of A, any element of B, that's A plus B. The product's a little trickier. The product, you can't just take a naive product. Um, and yeah, I guess the, um, oh, what's the um, idea here? I'm, I'm gonna mess up the, my, um, yeah, when the ideals aren't principal, you, you run into trouble. So I'll um, skip over this since I only have a few minutes left. Um, but this is how we have to take the product. We have to do um, finite sums of products of the two elements of ideals, not just products. Kind of the, the issue here is um, A1, B1 um, plus A2, B2, that element should be in the ideal A times B but it isn't necessarily if I'm just taking an element of A times an element of B. If I can't factor some element of A out of A1 and A2, I'm kind of hosed. That's the, 
the basic idea of why we have to take these finite sums. Um, okay, yeah, so um, Coomer, Dedekind, and really Emmy Noether um, generalized this beyond just number rings. Uh, she was the one who took it to commutative rings and really pushed the theory um, to lay a lot of the groundwork here. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff I'd like to get to. Um, so let's see, in just the last couple minutes, I just want to see if we can cook up how prime ideals um, rectify the situation here with 6 is 2 times 3 is um, 1 plus square root of minus 5, one, uh, 1 minus square root of minus 5. So we're going to look at everything as ideals. So I got six. Um, I'll just put um, bars around them like this because I don't want to write z adjoining the square root of negative five a whole bunch of times. Six is two times three. So this is also true as a product of ideals. With principal ideals, we can just take the, the naive product that you want to take, um, or you just take the product of two elements. It, with non-principal ideals, you run into trouble. You need both A1 and A2 to have that a same common factor. And if you don't have a common factor gem, generating your ideal, you run into trouble. And that's it's non-principal ideals that makes us need this weird definition for multiplication. Um, so I also have this as a an equality of ideals, because they're all principal in this case. Um, and so the idea here is I take norms. Two has norm um, four, three has norm nine, one plus square root of minus five actually has norm six from this computation right here. Um, the other root of x squared plus five is minus the square root of negative five. So I get six and six. Okay, cool. So that's what's going on with norms. Um, and so it turns out, and you can define the norm of an ideal as well. Um, I'll spare you all that. But um, it turns out that the ideal two factors as the ideal generated by not one element, because if it was generated by one element, we could just factor two further. But um, the ideal two is this ideal squared. And the ideal three, and notice that in this ideal, I could put one plus the square root of minus five here, or I could put one minus the square root of minus five here. Why? Because I can take the sums of these two elements in this ideal, and that's still gonna be in the ideal. I can take the differences. So if I subtract two from this, then I get, um, or I guess I need to multiply by negative one and add two, but um, point being, one minus the square root of minus five is also in this ideal too. But with three, that doesn't quite happen. So three splits into two ideals. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, so two, factors as this ideal squared. So the ideal two is this ideal squared, and the ideal three is um, this product of two ideals right here. And so now, um, and uh, let's see, these puppies right here um, turn into two, one plus the square root of minus five times three, one plus the square root of minus, or one, these should be minuses. This should be a minus. Sorry, I'll finish up here. I know I'm going a little over. That's what this ideal factors. And this ideal right here factors into two, one plus the square root of minus five times three, one plus the square root of minus five, Right there. Now, as ideals, we can see that these factorizations are in fact the same. Here I have 
two of uh, the ideal two one plus the square root of minus five this ideal and this ideal here i have two of this ideal this ideal and this ideal so six this is exhibiting the same factorization into ideals of six so um yeah sorry for going over a little bit there but i just wanted to kind of illustrate that this ideal notion saves the day unfortunately these aren't principal they're not generated by one element if they were i could just have a nice factorization into primes of six but they're pretty reasonable ideals you know they're generated by two elements and then in fact that's a fact for dedekind domains that you can always anyway, i'll i'll stop rambling and i'll stop and ask for questions if there are any questions at this point yeah that every field is generated, like every extension of like k equals e, that's divided by f mm -hmm. um, Just give an example, like how would you do that for like a bi-quadratic extension, like an x to the square root of e? Mm, um, yeah, so for that, I think I'd need like, if I do square root of p plus square root of q, will that work? Um, it's the, the theorem name is the primitive, primitive element theorem. Um, and yeah, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember how the, the, uh, the proof goes. Um, yeah, like I, I think for the biquadratics adding it will often uh, one of them will will clear, and you'll be left over with a remainder term with the other one, and um, you'll see that that element actually has order four, or satisfies a degree four polynomial. But the the idea with that is if if you're throwing in a bunch of square roots, say a bunch of different square roots, you just need to cook up an element that satisfies a big enough degree polynomial, and um, I guess the primitive element theorem says there will be one. It, it's um, yeah, sorry, I can't remember how to prove it off the top of my head. Other other questions? Yeah. Um. Off the top of my head, I, that's a great question. Um, I can't remember a counterexample, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm skeptical. You couldn't have something like, uh, like cook up polynomial X cubed plus X squared minus a half X plus seven, throw that into the rationals. That'll be a nice, degree three extension of the rationals. It's norm and trace will both be nice integers, but that one half there, in order to make that polynomial an integer polynomial, it'd have to clear denominators and it's no longer monic. So that's a great question. Was that what you were gonna? No. Ah, yeah, okay, there you go. It's true for quadratics because those are the only two coefficients you gotta, gotta worry about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. And I had the same question as I was blearily writing my notes up last night of like, this isn't an if and only if, is it? And I, I don't know. I, I hazily convinced myself that I should just write it as a, a one just directional statement and not risk it. So great question. That's that's a great that's a great question, and I I, I don't think it's a it's coming up here on the um, uh, what you call it. So I'll just say it again. If you if someone hands you an ideal 
and says, check if this is prime. I mean, like checking by hand in some weird, weird, arbitrary commutative ring that's not a domain or something could be very hard. Um, but usually what I think of is, um, and I think I have this somewhere in here in my notes. Um, right, yeah, actually that was the next uh, excellent point because it's the next definition I have. A prime is an ideal such that when I mod out by it, I'm left with a domain, so a place without zero divisors, which makes sense because if I have two things that aren't in the ideal, they're not zero, then they multiply together to be in the ideal, which I'm quotienting out by, so I'll get zero. So I can check, I think sometimes it's easier for me to, ch to mod out by an ideal and see what I get, and that kind of tells me whether or not it's prime. Like for these ideals right here, I mod out by two, I get like z mod two z, and then the square root of five becomes equivalent to one. So when I mod out by this ideal, I just get z mod 2z, which is not, not only a domain, it's a field, um, which is great. Um, so that's, that's an excellent, I'm glad you brought that up. So usually in practice, at least for my mind, it's easier to think about just modding out and seeing what I get when I mod out. And if it's a domain, if it doesn't have zero divisors, then I had a prime ideal. And the wonderful fact that I, I mentioned here is that for Dedekind domains, for these rings of integers, Prime ideals are actually not just going to be prime ideals of non-zero prime ideals are not just going to be prime ideals. They're going to be maximal ideals, which means when I mod out by them, I don't just get a domain, I get a field. And of course, we know from Z what the fields are. It's, you know, Z mod 5Z, Z mod 7Z, all, all are nice finite fields. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. They end up being like conjugates of some sort. Um. Yeah. So that's a. Um, no. So that that's that's a great question, and um, in the case of quadratics. Oh yeah. So um, the if I'm if I'm uh, repeating it right, it's it's kind of like what's up with the oh no. Um, it's kind of like, what's up with the conjugateness here? And the fact that like here, it seemed to be just the fact that one plus square root of minus five and one minus the square root of minus five differed by two when, when really, or, you know, I could have, I could have written this maybe like two, one plus square root of minus five, two, one minus square root of minus five. But then notice those ideals are actually the same ideal. What's going on? And that's an excellent thing to notice. And the the idea here is um, the okay. I'll, I'll give you the kind of higher fluting answer is um, these different embeddings are kind of like you can think of all you can think of a group kind of permuting the roots of your polynomial, and that actually is going to so, okay, the Galois group permutes the roots. So I can look at moving the roots of the polynomial around. And that's a really useful idea that we've, you know, taken for a run in algebraic number theory. And when I move those roots around, it fixes Q. You know, so I can look at the automorphisms of K that fix Q. Because I want to fix Q. I don't want to mess with Q and Z. So if I'm moving the roots of, around and I have Q and Z fixed, then it'll move the prime ideals upstairs around but it'll leave the downstairs prime fixed. So the thing, excellent, excellent, excellent point. The thing to notice here is sending square root of minus five to minus square root of minus five, those, that flips these ideals around, but it, it doesn't flip three around because of course I, I wouldn't want to flip the integer. I wouldn't want to move the integers around. I just want to move the upstairs stuff around. That's what Galois theory is, is moving the upstairs stuff around and fixing the base and then you know, see, you can kind of sift out by seeing what moves around and what doesn't move around. <laughs> that is the most ridiculous explanation of Galois theory ever. Okay, I think I've gone 10 minutes over now, um, but that's a great point, and it's no coincidence that those things are conjugate. Okay, yeah, okay.